so welcome to the gujarat isar program so welcome all very good evening and first of all i would like to welcome dr mehul damani who is an md gynac ex honorary assistant professor he has done lot of diplomas he is a senior practicing ivf specialist and director planet women welcome dr mehul please may i request you to take the con hello everybody on this uh, beautiful uh, saturday afternoon i welcome you all on behalf of the gujarat chapter isar and uh, we are organizing this uh, unique uh, and the practical cme on basic tips and tricks in the fertility practice so we have selected galaxy of the speakers who are uh, doing uh, infertility practice deeply involved in the ivf practice since years and years and uh, they are so much academic that uh, they will give you the clear highlights and practical tips in uh, day to day fertility practice gujarat chapter isar is uh, taking a step ahead in the form of webinar now onwards because of corona all of us now cannot have a formal get together and meeting so now we are forgetting corona and now we are uh, moving ahead towards our the favorite fertility practice and uh, with the first step to put on the gujarat chapter isar is organizing this webinar and we have invited galaxy of speakers and uh, all our senior practicing fertility specialists since years and uh, first of all i would like to invite dr uh, tusar sa he is the president of uh, gujarat chapter isar this year and he is the one of the pioneer in the ivf practice in gujarat he is uh, doing i think ivf practice since 1987 onwards and uh, we are all very delighted to welcome you sir and uh, he is a ex associate professor at nhl medical college and uh, is master of all endoscopy ivf and his specialties thermal balloon technology also uh dr tusar sa uh, before you uh, start anything i would request the uh, our uh, technical people to show interesting video on amdavad and then dr tusar was speak okay should i start or just we go for a video so one video okay
डॉक्टर तुषार साह वी वेलकम यू ऑल फ्रॉम दिस वाइब्रेंट सिटी ऑफ अहमदाबाद एंड स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट स्पीकर इंट्रोडक्शन डॉक्टर नागोरी गुड आफ्टरनून फ्रेंड्स ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ गुजरात चैप्टर रिसर आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन दिस टू डे सी एम ई वन ऑफ द ऑब्जेक्शन ऑफ गुजरात ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ गुजरात इसार इज स्प्रेडिंग ऑफ नॉलेज रिगार्डिंग द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ इनफर्टिलिटी पर्टिकुलरली टू द प्रैक्टिसिंग गायनेकोलॉजिस्ट विथ दिस एम टू डेज प्रोग्राम इज प्लान एंड द फर्स्ट टॉपिक इज कंट्रोल ओवर एंड हाइपर स्टिमुलेशन इन द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ इनफर्टिलिटी दिस इज अ वेरी सिंपल बट वेरी ट्रिकी एरिया हाइपर स्टिमुलेशन मीन्स स्टिमुलेट दू प्रोक्योर वन और टू ओवर इन सच ए वे the pregnancy rate improve and in this area dr nagore is probably the best person to impart knowledge about how to do it he is an ex associate professor of obgyn practicing infertility for last 35 years he is having many publications and many books to his credit i request dr chaitanya nagore to take over thank you the afternoon friends at the outset i am thankful to tushar and mehul both for inviting me here on this webinar i'll be talking on tips and tricks of practical use of clomifen letrozole and gonadotrophin all of you know that clomifen is normally used in who group 2 that is hypothalamus pituitary ovarian that is is intact but it is defective second is luteal phase defect where you have to improve the quality of the follicle luteal support is not required only the luteal quality of the follicle will take care of everything and third is an unexplained infertility even the late ovarian luteal fevers that it can be used for the unexplained infertility now all of you are using clomifen since so many years so i would like to tell you some of the salient points which are very useful in your clinical practice that is 50 to 150 mg is the maximum dose and that can be started on day 2 day 3 day 4 day 5 the results are same but for all practical purposes whenever you are doing for stimulation for an iui it should be started from day 5 if you are doing for ivf then it should be started from day 2 the reason is that the dominant follicle is already selected and now that follicle will be progress further more than 150 is only 10% of the pregnancy rate and professor bruno lonenfield recommends only 100 mg even professor ambok says that you start with 100 mg there is no need to go for 50 mg also but the long protocol and incremental doses are just to get your md examination once you get your md examination you should forget it so they are not used in a prior practice now when you use a clomifen citrate on day 8 or day 9 up to day 10 you should do an lh level this is particularly for all pco patients when lh level is more than 10 you should not repeat the clomifen in the second cycle you should switch over to the other therapy because the high lh is detrimental to an ova the pregnancy rates are very low and the abortion rates are very high second thing is only lh level increases when the clomifen is given more than 5 days so for tandem don't give an ex, uh, extended regime that increases only lh level and that is that's why the pregnancy rates are very low with an extended regime now it has got an anti estrogenic action and many a times the endometrium is less than 6 mm now what is the reason because the repeated subsequent cycle the zooclomifen accumulates and this zooclomifen is that is giving you the poor endometrium now how why you should remember this thing suppose the patient has come to you from your neighbor gynecologist he has already given clomifen citrate for 2 or 3 months and the patient comes to you the patient has already accumulated zooclomifen in the circulation and now if you start clomifen citrate the endometrium is going to be very poor and that's why the history taking is very important than recent last few months what the patient has taken that's why you should not give clomifen citrate to this group of the patient second very important thing is that the clomifen citrate uh, the follicle can reach to 24 mm size and this is because of the imbibation of the water if you start gonadotrophin the follicle ruptures after 16 to 18 mm but if it is clomifen then it is 24 mm because the water is absorbed inside 
we are always afraid that the follicle will rupture but it will not rupture because there is no positive feedback mechanism here that is always very late because the receptors are already occupied by clomiphene citrate at the hypothalamic level so even if the estrogen rises the lh surge does not occur and that's why follicle always ruptures at a later stage rather than in a routine practice so that's why there is no harm in going to 22 to 24 millimeter size the follicle is not going to rupture in all these cases the pregnancy rate is 40% and ovulation rate is 80% and that is because of the high lh that you get with clomiphene citrate and that's why it is not given more than 3 months and if the pregnancy does not occur in 3 months then you should switch over to the further therapy even us manufacturer package insert has also said that it should not be given for more than 3 months when you have already given clomiphene citrate the patient does not conceive in 3 months then you have options with adding hcg estrogen bromocutin dexona metformin and gonadotrophin now let us consider one by one uh, should you combine hcg whenever you are giving, uh, giving a clomiphene citrate when the follicle is mature we are tempted to give hcg and then we ask the patient to keep the relation for 3 days here if you are not going to do an iui then hcg is not justified because if the follicle is mature the e2 level is 150 picogram per ml per follicle and that is going to give a positive feedback mechanism that is going to give an lh surge and the follicle will rupture but in some of the cases if you give hcg earlier before the follicle is mature then it will cause the premature luteinization so in either way it is not working whether it is given early or whether the follicle is mature it's of no use so don't waste the money of the patient if you are not going to do an iui cc plus estrogen it is useless combination because the receptors are already occupied and about tons of estrogen is not going to help you to improve your endometrium so please don't combine estrogen to the clomiphene citrate estrogen therapy is absolutely ineffective Uh, clomiphene with bromocriptine there are two indications when you should combine a bromocriptine and i am talking of a normal prolactin level in which condition you should combine bromocriptine with a clomiphene citrate number 1 is a galactoria with a normal prolactin level galactoria i mean you should express the secretion from the breast put it under microscope and presence of fat globule is only galactoria simple simple discharge i have seen lot of patients taking uh, cabergolin for months together when they don't have a galactoria that's why presence of fat globule is must that is and second indication is it is very useful in cycle when you give a clomiphene citrate it increases the prolactin level and this prolactin level is a bad endometrium to this patient now this endometrium will improve if you give bromocriptine to this patient in the first half of the cycle you cannot give bromocriptine in a second half of the cycle because the normal level of prolactin is required for maintenance of corpus luteum so these are the spikers in which or uh, for the improvement of the endometrium you should start from day 5 uh, you should start bromocriptine to this patient and it should be given up to the 14th day now here cabergolin should not be given to the patient because the the effect of cabergolin last in the second half of the cycle also where the prolactin level will go down which is otherwise required for maintenance of corpus luteum so only two indication normal prolactin level with galactoria and second is the spikers uh clomiphene plus glucocorticoids an excellent drug which is under utilized in most of the time otherwise the dexamethasone which is given at night 0.5 mg continuously can be given for 3 to 6 months and it has got an excellent results uh, in a normal dhea with high androgen level particularly in the chronic anovulatory patients and resistant pco patient it is very useful even here the cochrane review says that it increases the five times increase in the pregnancy rate in the patient of pcos and it has 40% conception rate as compared to 5% in a control group so in a cc resistant cases particularly 100 to 150 mg then you should add the uh, dexamethasone to this patient and they will ovulate with 100 mg rather than increase those then come cc plus metformin if you see all the reports and particularly legro and mol these are two largest randomized control trial in the literature and they have found out that the clomiphene citrate is better than metformin and by adding uh, metformin regularly to a patient it does not increase the pregnancy rate metformin increases the ovulation in only cc resistant cases that's why the metformin should be combined only to those patients who have not ovulated with 100 to 150 mg of clomiphene citrate 
particularly it is more useful when the patient does not want a pregnancy suppose the patient has come to you as a gynecologist and patient wants a pregnancy after a few months then you should start metformin to this patient it establishes the normal homeostasis and when the patient wants to conceive immediately at that time even the clomiphene over the normal ovulation can occur and patient can conceive so it is particularly to be given to those patient who don't want to conceive immediately cc plus metformin is very useful in obese pcos patient and cc plus dexamethasone is very useful in a thin lean pco patients clomiphene plus gonadotropin i always say that it is a hopeless combination should never combine clomiphene with gonadotropin we are wasting the money of the gonadotropin because these are the cases where the clomiphene is not even the pregnancy and this is because of the high lh which is because of clomiphene now if you give gonadotropin it cannot improve the quality of the follicle and that is why the pregnancy rates are the same as that of the clomiphene whether it is clomiphene alone is given or it is given clomiphene plus fsi there are so many reports which are available and which have said that the it does not increase the pregnancy rate and only gonadotropin always gives the higher pregnancy rate and that's why this combination should not be used prior treatment to oc pills for 2 to 3 months uh, particularly when the antagonists were not available or if the patient is not that much affording then you can give oc pills for 2 to 3 months that will decrease an lh level and then the spontaneous ovulation is possible this is the uh, remedy at a discrete level that can be used uh, even today also that will decrease an lh level and uh, the spontaneous ovulation will be possible now if the patient has not conceived with all these combinations what is left to you is the letrozole and gonadotropin letrozole a marvelous drug the mechanism of action is hypoestrogenism and temporarily rise of testosterone now at a peripheral level there is an hypoestrogenism and this hypoestrogenism causes secretion of fsh and lh from the pituitary so it develops a follicle and the best advantage is at the local level in the ovary that temporary rise of estrogen what we are using dhgas or whatever estrogen patch in an ibf whatever we are using is only to increase the sensitivity of the follicle to the gonadotropin mm -hmm. so this temporary rise of testosterone will improve the sensitivity of the follicle to the gonadotropin and that is why the lower doses of the gonadotropin are required and that is why letrozole plus gonadotropin is one of the best combination now few things i would like to tell you about a letrozole because some people are prescribing as what one in the morning one in the evening but the half life is 48 hours and only once a dose is enough you have to give a daily once a dose second is the total compression with the maximum dose is up to 5 mg otherwise majority of the patients the estrogen level suppresses up to 90 to 98% 99% with 2.5 mg only and that is why you are supposed to give only 2 5 mg not even a 5 mg dose because your purpose of monofollicular development is lost whenever the uh, dose of the letrozole is increased second thing is the higher doses are toxic and it may uh, it may the uh, literature does not tell uh, what will be the effect on an ova afterwards maximum suppression is within 48 to 72 hours and after 7 days the estrogen rises and decreases the fsh and lh level that is the beauty of letrozole that the lh level decreases after 7 days which is not present in the clomiphene cited that causes increase in the lh level and that's why here the quality of the follicle is maintained and the follicle grows very well so monofollicular development less multiple pregnancy reduced chances of cancer that improved endometrial receptivity there are all the advantages and that is why letrozole is always better than clomiphene cited uh, in the practice now suppose the patient does not conceive with the clomiphene cited has not conceived with the gonadotropin then we switch over to the uh, with letrozole then we switch over to the gonadotropin and a super ovulation of gonadotropin particularly in an iui has always a higher pregnancy rate than time intercourse and the clomiphene cited particularly the baseline scan is a very important i don't go into the detail of it but the baseline scan will decide whether you require a lower dose or whether you require the higher doses and accordingly you start the stimulation protocol to the patient when you see the ovary when it is a normal responding ovary then we start with the conventional protocol we start with 75 mg give it for 5 days do a scan if the follicle is increasing or the endometrium is improving you can continue the same dose 
But if there is no improvement on the either side, then we increase to two ampules for three days, and then we do a scan. Normally, in almost all the cases, you will get a good follicle. But if you don't get a good follicle, it means your baseline scan is wrong. This is a poor responding ovary. It is not a normal responding ovary. And then from next cycle, you can start with a higher dose. And that is a poor responding ovary where you go with a step down protocol. You start with the higher dose. And once the follicle develops of 10 millimeters, you reduce the dose. Once it is 14 millimeters, still you reduce the dose. And then you can get a monofollicular development. This is particularly very useful as far as the oh, poor responder patients are concerned. Now, Chronic low dose protocol. This is an ultimate protocol as far as the prior practice is concerned because majority of our patients are always PCO patients who come with the infertility. And here you start with 75 units or even 37.5 according to your baseline scan. And you give it for 14 days. This is very important because you are tempted to increase the dose at any time. And most of the people after 5 or 7 days, they increase the dose in the practice because they are afraid that how many ampules I have to give. And that's why they increase the dose. And all of a sudden, you get multiple follicles on both the sides. So you should resist yourself not to increase the dose. Give 75, give it for 14 days. In majority of the patients, you will get a follicle. If you don't get a follicle, then increase by 37.5 units and give it for seven days. Almost more than 95% of cases, you will get a very good follicle. Here, there will not be any premature luteinization also. Even the antagonists are not required in this protocol. You get a good follicle and you get a very good pregnancy rate. A lot of patients who are even with an IVF failure or even who have undergone an hyperstimulation in the previous IVF cycle, they have conceived with this chronic low dose protocol. So you must use this chronic low dose protocol uh, in your practice, particularly in a PCO patient. It gives an excellent pregnancy rate. Here the OHF rate is very low. The multiple pregnancy rate is also very low. Now, Professor Roy Ambok says that instead of trimifrin straight straightway from very first month, you should start with an FSI because it gives almost double the pregnancy rate. And in a private practice, see, something in an academic practice is different than when you are practicing in your private. It means the patient has fixed number of months the patient is going to stay with you. If you take more months for the patient to conceive, majority of the patients will go to your neighbor. And that is why your criteria should be that the patient should be considered with the very first month the patient has come to you. You can't take a trials of drugs for the conception of the patient. And that's why what he says that in all PCO patients, you start with the gonadotropin. Here, you have all the advantages except the cost, uh, cost factor and you have all the advantages. But if you consider the total cost on all these patients, there is always a clear superiority of the low dose FSH over the clomiphene citrate because the time taken for the pregnancy is very low and uh, very first month you can start gonadotropin to this patient. Now there is always a problem which gonadotropin is to be used in a practice. Everybody comes and tells that our products are very good and what you should use. You should remember only one thing that the bioactivity and immunoactivity are different at different times. Well, the FSH which is secreted after the menstruation is having the least bioactivity, while FSH which is secreted during the periovulatory period is having the highest bioactivity. And that is why recombinant FSH which is prepared from a Chinese larva, which is cloned in such a way that it mimics the periovulatory FSH. And that is why the dose required of recombinant FSH is always less, while the dose required of urinary gonadotropin, which is prepared from the menopausal urine, like weeping the tired horse, that uh, the, it is having a list bioactivity and that's why the more doses are required for that. All the meta-analysis which tell that the FSH is always better than HMG. I'm not against HMG, but my physiology tells me that HMG should be used if you have down-regulated the patient or you, are, or you are using agonist or antagonist to the patient. See, endogenous LH is always present when you are doing an IUI practice. You have not down-regulated the patient. And that's why the endogenous LH is always present. So that's why I always prefer FSH over HMG. Because if you add more HMG ampules, the LH level will go high. It will reach to a ceiling level and it may spoil the quality of an OVA. So that's why you don't get any advantage uh, by adding HMG to the patient. But you definitely get a disadvantage if the dose is high, then it will cross a ceiling level. It's only required in a very few cases, particularly very old patients where the bioactivity of LH is low 
or when there is LH polymorphism, there are very few cases where you may require an HMJ to this patient. If you see, this is the famous Salim Dial slide of uh, uh, telling that recombinant FSH is always better. I told you that let us offer the recombinant FSH the best combination because the dose required of gonadotropin is very less and you can take more number of cycles, uh, your IUI cycles and the pregnancy rates will be very good. We have got a scoring system that will be discussed afterwards also in an IUI how you should give it. There are no antagonists. Please never use antagonists up to your IUI cycle. And uh, sorry, agonists should not be used in your IUI cycle. Antagonists are to be used, particularly in a PCO patient when there is a premature luteinization is likely to occur when the size of the follicle is 14 millimeter. At that time, you start antagonists to the patient. So there won't be an LH uh, then give HCG and do an IUI when the follicle matures. Uh, the last point I would like to tell you about the ovarian drilling has got an equivalent result that of the gonadotropin. So those patients who cannot afford the gonadotropin, then you can go for an ovarian drilling and particularly drilling should be done to those patients where the insulin resistance is high or in your 3D, if you see that the stromal volume is very high and there are a lot of evidences in, uh, in the literature that the number of punctures should be done according to the stromal volume. The criteria for only four punctures has gone since so many years. But, and that's why I always suggest that the number of punctures should be according to the insulin resistance and according to the stromal volume. Don't do punctures in PCO like ovary. Stamp it by 3D, stamp it by insulin resistance and then and then the, it is to be done. Triggering of ovulation by either recombinant HCG 250 microgram or HCG 10,000 can be given to a patient. If you give GNR agonist as a trigger, it always causes the luteal defect and judicious luteal support is given. But otherwise, routinely HCG is given to all the patients. I think Jayesh is going to discuss this thing. That's how we did. So just to summarize my talk that 100 milligram CC should be tried only for three months, provided they eight LH less than 10. CC plus HCG has got no role, CC plus estrogen, no role, CC plus metformin, no role, CC plus dopamine only for spikers and galactoria, CC plus HCG is given only when you want to do an IUI, CC plus metformin, when 150 milligram of CC is not ovulated, then and then metformin is to be added to the patient. CC plus dexamethasone in a chronic anovulatory and resistant PCO, excellent result. CC plus gonadotropin not beneficial, not to be used in practice. Letrozole can almost replace clomiphen citrate. Gonadotropin excellent results. Agonists are not to be used. Agoni antagonists have, are very useful in a thin lane PCO patient and ovarian drilling has got an excellent results. So stimulation protocol should be tailor made for each patient on a baseline scan and time of HCG must be decided by an ultrasound. Uh, with the Doppler for doing an IUI. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Nagori. Uh, wonderful talk. And uh, as always, uh, to the point and uh, clear-cut take-home messages, rather I would say strong messages because uh, many of us are doing uh, a kind of a different practice in a day-to-day -day scenario. So people have a lot of questions in mind for Dr. Nagori. And I think Dr. Tushan is also in the mood of the fight with the Dr. Nagori. And that is the beauty of uh, uh, your talk, Dr. Nagori, sir. And uh, in the era of the lockdown, everybody is watching Mahabharata uh, in the free time. So I have uh, designated you a term of the Bhishma Pitam of infertility practice in Gujarat. So, thank you, Dr. Nagori Sahib, for your excellent presentation. And uh, for the second talk, we will like to invite Dr. Sonal Panchal. I would like to tell that uh, we will take all question answer in the last after uh, finishing all the four talks. And uh, we invite Dr. Sonal Panchal. She is a master of uh, sonography and she has changed uh, the momentum of the sonography uh, practices in Gujarat and all over India and uh, I request Dr. Tusar Sa to give her formal introduction. Chaitanya, thank you very much for excellent talk and very nice tip and very clear cut tip to all who are practicing infertility. Now during control over and hyperstimulation, 
equally important is a monitoring of the follicle as well as endometrial thickness and vascularity it is very vital decision in decision making regarding how to use gonadotropin how to use hcg as a trigger the result depend upon the right answer about your questions so sonography is very important and monitoring we have a dr sondal she is very renowned internationally renowned sonologist she has many international publications and books to her credit and i think she will give you proper justice about the monitoring of the follicle and endometrium during control or in hyperstimulation i request sonal to take over the mic thank you very much tushar bhai uh, for that very kind introduction thank you to mayur bhai and tushar bhai and the entire gc isa team for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you all and my today's topic is i'm sorry just a second my today's topic is day to day use of ultrasound and doppler for cycle monitoring yes it is truly day to day use because each and every cycle of hours uh that means the patient the, the doctors who are dealing with infertility has to be monitored because each of them has an ovulation induction done and believe me ultrasound is the tool to monitor doctor plays an instrumental role because the hormonal changes that are occurring throughout the cycle whether it's a treatment cycle or a natural cycle are they reflect first as hormonal changes and then as morphological changes so if you are you if you are following the doppler changes the vascular changes you are more close to the hormonal changes that are occurring ultrasound can be helpful at almost every step during the entire cycle at the start of the stimulation you are having all small follicles and you are going to decide what stimulation protocol to give to decide the the follicular maturity to decide the endometrial receptivity and also to monitor the luteal but before we discuss that a quick look look into the machine settings is very very important because if the machine is not put properly to get those pictures optimally then it is not possible to make a correct diagnosis and not possible to monitor the cycle correctly when first to the duty settings most important is to correct a correct to to select a correct preset and you very lucky that our machines with individual stroke selection has so many presets that we can dedicate one preset to our infertility practice and we do not have to do any adjustments for during during the entire scan yes but it is important that depending on the patient's opacity or the depth of the pelvis you might have to change the angle and the depth for example when you introduce the probe your angle is totally open you have a broad field now you locate the ovary you have to then decrease the angle so that you get a more sharp picture and after that you also decrease so we are decreasing the angle now and after that you also decrease the depth so to get a large picture of the ovary and then as required you may adjust your focal zone or you may use zoom to produce a picture which fills up at least two third of the image so that is the way you optimize the 2d setting for the doppler settings it is important that you set your doppler color doppler and the power doppler prf at 0.3 for all infertility scans for panic scans we are adjusting it between 0.3 and 0.6 wall filter has to be the lowest and there should be adequate balance and gain setting for the pulse wave doppler also prf should be between 0.9 to 1.3 wall filter 3 30 yards adequate balance and gain setting and sample volume should be 2 mm oh my god you'll say that we are gynecologists we are not radiologists how are we going to adjust this don't worry about it just give, give this one slide this settings to your application person and tell him or her to put this in a particular preset which you name it as infertility and every time you switch it on you are you will be on the same setting so that is how the life can be absolutely simple now where do you use this ultrasound or when do you monitor one before starting the stimulation protocol and that is very very important because 
we are now going to stimulate the ovary to produce as rightly Tushar Bhai said in the in, in, in the beginning of the session that you want to produce more than one follicles, two or three, they should be good in quality to give us a better pregnancy rate. The second is to decide the time of trigger, what to use as a trigger and how many IUIs we want to do or what should be the exact time of IUI and of course for the luteal phase assessment. More IUI cycles, as long as you're going to use clomiphenol letrozole, you actually do not require to do a pre-treatment or a baseline scan because you are not going to give gonadotropin except to rule out a follicular phase or a retinal pulse region which But if you are going to use gonadotropins, you must know what is the ovarian reserve and the response. And the reserve means how many follicles you'll get at the end of stimulation, which can be decided by the enteral follicle count and the ovarian volume, whether the response, which can be decided by the intra-ovarian stromal flow. But actually speaking, if I'm talking of IUI cycles, my main concern is I should not end up into multifollicular growth and OHSs. Even if the patient is a poor reserve patient, has only two, three follicles on each side, it's not a major problem because for IUI, I only require one or two follicles, maximum three, which I can get with that low enteral follicle count also. I am more worried about OHSs. And even in PC patients, I'm not worried about exact how many number of follicles are there. I just have to know it's a PC or not because... I'm not going to, again, stimulate it to multiple follicles. Counting the enteral follicles, though, is important and can be done by 2D. Remember, when you count the follicles by 2D, just scroll across the entire ovary. Don't rotate the probe. If you rotate the probe, you are going to overcount the number of follicles. Just scroll across, eyeball, and count the number of follicles, and that tells you the correct number. Whether you use 2D or 3D, as long as the follicle number is less than 15, you're just okay. Both are equally accurate. And for IUI practice, you do not require sophisticated softwares like Sony ABC to count the enteral follicles. If considering AMH, again, that is not required as far as you are going to do an IUI cycle and you have done your enteral follicle count correctly. AFC and AMH will not offer any mutually exclusive information alone or in combination. Both have equal and similar predictive power. Measuring the ovarian volume can be done on 2D by getting three orthogonal largest diameters. Take the long section of the ovary, measure the longest diameter. On the same section, measure the longest diameter perpendicular to this long diameter, which is the AP diameter. Rotate your probe 90 degree and just take a transverse diameter. And that is the the side-to-side the -side diameter or the width of the ovary. And multiplying this three diameter me measurements with 0 0.523 will give you the ovary. Again, you don't have to remember this. The machine is going to calculate for you one tap calculated the three diameter. The sophisticated softwares like vocal again for IUI is not required. But it is important to know and remember that it is AFC and ovarian volume which provide the direct measurements of the ovarian reserve. All the hormonal investigations, they are indirect measurements and are not essential as long as the IUI practice is concerned. Ovarian stromal flow in the early follicular phase is related to the subsequent ovarian response. And that, which, that is what tells us what should be the dose of gonadotropin. Stromal PSV, the peak systolic velocity, is predictive of the ovarian responsiveness. If we gather all the literature information, it tells us that if the ovarian stromal resistance index, RI, is less than 0.58 and the peak is more than 10 centimeters per second, the patient is a hyper responder. If the RI is between 0.6 and 0.7 and the base is between 5 and 10, patient is a normal responder. And if the RI is more than 0.7 and the PSV is more than 5, the patient is a poor responder. What is this RI and PSV? PSV, we know it is a peak systolic velocity, but 
RI and PI are measurements of resistance. Flow into any pipe or a vessel can be calculated by two things. One, the resistance to the flow and two, the systolic velocity or the end diastolic. RI is measured as systolic velocity minus diastolic velocity divided by systolic velocity. And for all low resistance flow vessels, RI is the parameter which can be compared for the resistance. If it is a high velocity vessel like a uterine artery, where it is likely at times that the diastolic flow may reach zero, when the RI becomes not comparable at all, then you use PI. And PI is the pulsatility index, which is calculated as systolic minus diastolic velocity divided by a temporal average or mean velocity of the entire cycle. These are the two parameters that we are going to use. Again, remember you don't have to use your efficiency into this. Once you have taken a spectrum, you can just press on the auto calculation and the machine will give you the value. The logical and the very important explanation to why stromal flows tell you how much doses of gonadotropins is that if the flow to the ovary is more, more percentage of the total gonadotropins loaded into the patient system is going to flow into the ovary and therefore if the flows to the ovary are more, you require to load less doses of gonadotropins into the patient system and vice versa. That means good flows in the ovaries, patient is a good responder. Less flow in the ovaries, patient is a poor responder. To simplify this entire thing and use all the uh, parameters which are very important, we have devised a scoring system which is to be done on day two or three of the cycle. The baseline scan which is done once works for at least six months. So for the same therapy, you don't have to repeat it again. And it uses all the parameters that affects the gonadotrophin dose, age, BMI, the ovarian volume, stromal RI and stromal PSV. All those parameters which demand higher doses for stimulation, that means they are all poor reserve, poor responder patients, have a lower score. And all those parameters which require lower doses because they are hyper responders get higher score. Depending on what is the baseline score. For example, it's very simple to use this score. For example, I'm doing a scan, the patient's her uh, age is say 32, her BMI is say uh, uh, 27, her AFC is 12, her ovarian volume is 6, her stromal RI is 0. 0.6 and her stromal PSV is also 6. That means 3, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 and 18. So that is her score. Now if that is the score, with the decided scores, we have devised decided doses of our FSH, the recombinant FSH. And once you apply this, the results are so good. I'm not discussing the entire simulation protocol in details, but if you just use this uh, simulation protocols, we have more than 5,000 patients already done. Zero modular severe OHSS, 0.05% of mild OHSS, in extremely low cancellation rates and very easily manageable multiple pregnancy rates. There's one more factor which is very important to decide when you are going to start a stimulation, especially for IUI cycles. Don't start gonadotrophin stimulation if all the follicles are smaller than 8 or 9 millimeters. Because the smaller follicles, they do not have FSH receptors. You're actually going to waste on those gonadotrophins. So if you start stimulation with gonadotrophins only after a follicle or two reach 8 or 9 millimeters, that means you're going to use less doses of gonadotrophins. Moreover, it will also give you a monofollicular development, which is your aim for your IUI cell. Why so? Because it is usually day five or day seven of day five of the cycle that the dominant follicle is selected. It becomes apparent on sonography also by day five or day seven. If you start gonadotrophins after the dominance is reached, when you give FSH, only that follicle is going to grow, and therefore it will result in monofollicular development. But if you start gonadotrophins early, when the follicles are still getting sensitized to FSH, because of the high FSH level, multiple follicle growth will happen and therefore you do not want to get start stimulation in IUI cycles before day 5. 
Once you start stimulation, the dominance of the follicles has been achieved. This follicle grows at a definite rate of 2 to 3 millimeters a day. Ovulation, we all know, occurs about follicle size of 18 to 24 millimeters. It is on this follicle that you would observe on 2D that a, a, a hypoechoic halo appears about 24 to 36 hours before the rupture. And a tiny solid projection, which is actually the cumulus, again appears only about 24 to 36 hours before the rupture. These are tiny structures and therefore optimization of the image is very, very important, which we have learned in the big. It is about 6 to 10 hours before the rupture that you'll get very low level equal inside the follicular lumen, very close to the wall. And this tells you that this is an impending ovulation. Remember, it is very important to measure the follicular size correctly, just like ovaries in the same way, three orthogonal diameters is important. Always inner to inner, don't take just random three diameters that can not give you the correct of, uh, follicular size. Once the follicle grows dominant, the vascularity starts developing and two days before the ovulation reaches the lowest resistance, and when the follicular vessels, perifollicular vessels cover at least two-thirds, preferably three-fourths of the circumference, with an RI of less than 0.5 and a PSV of more than 10 centimeters per second, that is when you will say this follicle is functionally mature. And this vascularity can be correlated to the estrogen labels. If the vascularity is not sufficient, there is a very high chance of getting Ova, an embryo, therefore, chromosomal abnormalities, especially when the PSV is less than 10 centimeters per second. And therefore, looking at the vascularity is much more important than just the size of the follicle. More uniform the very follicular vascularity is, better is the chance of pregnancy. Naturally, because if the vascularity is more, the estrogen level is more, the follicle quality is better. And this can be assessed not only by 2D, but by 3D. Objectively, or objectively, but we will not go into the details of that. I'd just like to inform you that if your 2Ds and Dopplers do not give you good results, 3Ds definitely help you to diagnose the, the, the dark holes and you can sort out the problem. So 3D has a definite role in your in, in, in competing with your failures. What happens after the surge? If you have by chance crossed the surge, there is a continuous rise in PSP with the start of the surge and this can be related to the LH levels. If the PSV of the follicle starts rising beyond 10 with a low RI, it tells you that you are closer to the rupture. It reaches as high as 45 centimeters per second an hour before rupture and therefore when you are doing a pre-trigger scan and you see that the PSV is more than 20, you should do two IUIs, one at 12 to 14 hours before the trigger, after the trigger, the second 36 to 38 hours after the trigger because the PSV was high, you are already on the search, you are not here, you are somewhere here and therefore the rupture is going to occur early and you can see in this results, the yellow bars which are much taller than the red bars are the pregnancies with double IUI which are definitely high when the PSV is more than 20 centimeters per second. Now, correlating the endometrial behavior with these hormonal changes. Number one, very important. We are all talking about the endometrial thickness, but it should be measured correctly. Never ever measure the endometrial thickness when the endometrium is not perpendicular to the sound wave. So you should bring the endometrium right in the center, and after that only you should measure the endometrial thickness. You should measure it from the outer margin of the hyperechoic line to the outer margin of the hyperechoic line. It should be perpendicular to the central line. Once you have measured the endometrium, this is this is not right, this is right. We know that the endometrium becomes multilayered with the effect of estrogen. It becomes multilayered, at, but it's seen day six or seven of the cycle as the estrogen level rises. It first go, grows to grade B because the endometrium is multilayered with intervening area, which is an echoic or severely hypoechoic. Then when the estrogen level rises beyond one mature follicle, that means it is 200 to 300 to 400 grams per ml, that's when you get a grade A endometrium. That means when you have two, three follicles, you should get an endometrium like this with intervening area which has echogenicities inside, but not more than that of the anterior myometrium. 
and when there are multiple follicles, you will act like in PCO patients. That's when you will get a great PN, which is isoechoic to the myometrium, not hyperechoic. As long as it is not hyperechoic, it is only estrogen free dominated endometrium. That means it indirectly also tells you how is the follicle quality. If you have one follicle and you have a great endometrium, wow, it's an excellent quality follicle. But if you have two, three follicles, you still have a great B follicle, uh, great B endometrium, the follicle quality is not good. The estrogen in the endometrium, in, in the uh, produced by the follicle, responds as increase in thickness of the endometrium, increase vascularity and the cervical mucus. These signs are present, that means the estrogen level is good and it's rising. The vascularity increases with follicular vascularity, reaches maximum three days before the ovulation, and you call the endometrium to have good receptivity when the vascularity reaches the inner layers of the endometrium, covers at least five millimeter square area, and has an RI of less than 0.6. Moreover, it is also important to confirm that the uterine artery PI is less than 3.2. So these are the parameters which are required. You can add 3D to it. You can add the endometrial volume and the 3D power Doppler parameters. Let me improve your If you keep all the things together, follicle which is at least 16 millimeters, preferably 18 millimeters, vascular covering p fourth of the circumference, RI less than 0.5, and PSV more than 10 centimeters per second is a good follicle. Endometrium at least 6 mm, preferably 8 to 10 mm, grade A or B is best. You can have grade C also. Clarity in zone 3 and 4, covering 5 mm square area, and RI of less than 0.6, and that is your good endometrium. The uterine atri PI of less than 3.2. Uh, what happens to the endometrium after the surge? We know that in the follicle after the surge, the PSV rises. When the PSV rises, when the LH rises, we know the progesterone also starts increasing. And when the progesterone starts increasing, the estrogen level is falling. So there is a period in between where the estrogen is low and the progesterone is also low. During this period, the uterine artery increases and the endometrial flow decreases. Why I discuss this is very important. If you are looking at the flows and you see that the uterine PI is high, you would think the follicle is not mature, I'll wait. But there are two scenarios. Follicle may actually not be uh, not be mature when the follicle has a low PSV, and then you have to wait, continue the stimulation, and then you'll get better better parameter. But if the uterine atri PI is high and the follicle PI is also high, which means the sur surge has already started, and in these cases you need a double IO. Everybody is worried about a high progesterone level before the trigger, and it's important to understand that. In every cycle, on the day of IUI, if you see the endometrium, the endometrium will not be as we have seen in grade A and B. It would be outer uh, fluffiness of the outer margin of the endometrium. And this indicates physiological label and physiological time of exposure of progesterone, which is absolutely required for IUI. But if the endometrium starts becoming hyperechoic outer margin, then it is a pathological label and the pathological duration of the progesterone and this is not good for receptivity. As the progesterone <coughs> exposure increases, the endometrium epigenicity starts increasing from the outer margin and reaches the central line only in the middle Same for the vascularity. The vascularity is going to be maximum pre-ovulatory, then it is going to decrease during the ovulation and it will again increase in the mid-luteal phase. Therefore, it is very, very important to exactly understand the, uh, the, the vascularity and that will guide you to the exact time of ovulation. Just quickly see a few scenarios in two minutes. Thin endometrium in the pre-ovulatory phase. If the junctional zone is intact, you only have to think of either Escherman or hyperprolactinemia, especially if it is a CC cycle. If it is altered, Think of chronic endometritis or adenomyosis. If you have a pre-ovulatory endometrium which is sick, but you're not seeing any follicle, the follicle might have just ruptured and you're getting a fluffy endometrium. Or there is a PCO patient with multiple follicles, cumulative estrogen level is high and you're getting <clears throat> multilayered endometrium. When the follicle doesn't rupture after the trigger, remember, either you have given at a wrong time, the follicle is still not mature, 
or you have given a trigger which is inadequate we will not discuss the luteal phase i know i have already crossed the time but i would just want to explain you that good ultrasound monitoring is the key to the success of iui thank you very much thank you very much sonal ben for a nice elaboration on the ultrasound and the ovulation cycle monitoring and uh, you made a really colorful presentation and uh, everybody should uh, now start using the ovulation cycle by the color doppler at least not uh, 3d 4d i advocate but at least start with the color doppler it will uh, add lot of color to your uh, results also so uh, lot of take home messages lot of uh, uh, pi ri and psv messages but uh, you don't have to remember all this thing just uh, have a recording of this lecture and uh, you can uh, remember all the values and you can implement in your practice thank you sonal ben we have a lot of questions uh, but we will take uh, afterwards after all these four lectures are uh, finished and uh, we have now more than 300 delegates on the uh, viewing platform so it uh, shows the huge popularity of the all faculties so i congratulate all faculties and gujarat chapter isar for this wonderful webinar and with this remark i would like dr tushar sir to invite the next speaker dr jay samin sonal very nice presentation thank you very much you have clear many ideas about the monitoring of the follicles and endometrium after ovulation what is required is a either time intercourse or intrauterine insemination iui is also a very good option and it is a time tested procedure it is simple effective and economical proper semen analysis is a game changer and semen wash is required by a very good embryologist or andrologist today we have dr darbesh kapadia who has got a training as a embryologist in australia melbourne university and he is a big name in the field of embryology all over india he will tell us various areas of semen wash in iui dr dharmesh please come dharmesh are you ready i think uh, dharmesh are you ready for the presentation Dharmesh? Yes, yes, yes. Wait. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, friends. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. So first of all, I thank uh, my mentor, Dr. Tushar sir, a good friend, Mehul sir. all the gcr uh, gc uh, uh, gujarat chapter isar members and all my friends uh, today i am going to talk about uh, a little different topic for uh, gynecologist uh, it is semen analysis and how we do iui i am going to go into very basics how we go ahead with that so this semen analysis is very important investigation whenever a couple comes to the gynecologist the more concentration is always is going to go in the female uh, a lot of investigations lot of you know uh, uh, sonography and all the stuff but semen analysis gives you around 50% of the reason why the male or why the patient is infertile so whenever we ask the or the gynecologist ask the patient for semen analysis there are basic screening test which is to be done like as it is done commonly hiv hbsg hcv now basically let me briefly tell you what is semen it is a mixture of sperms and secretions and which at the time of ejaculation is combined with the secretions from the testis and epididymis prostate seminal glands and bulbourethral glands now whenever a patient of semen analysis comes to your clinic what are the instructions you are supposed to give them first is abstinence day the patient should not be ejaculating between 2 to 7 days the reason being if the 
the abstinence is less than two days, then the count is going to be less. And if the abstinence is more than seven days, the quality, most probably the motility is going to be less. No use of lubricants while producing the sample because lubricants are most of the times permissible and it can kill a lot of sperms. While collecting, collection is being done, the clean wide mouth container is to be used. It is very important because the initial part of the ejaculate contains a lot of sperms. So if by chance, if the initial part of the ejaculate is been lost, then the count and all the, your parameters are going to get disturbed. Now, a lot of patients will come to your clinic and saying that I am not comfortable producing sample at your place. Can I collect it at home and come to your clinic? Okay, he can do it, but the condition is he should be reaching to the lab as early as possible, preferably within an hour. And the most important thing in any busy IVF lab or any busy IUI lab, the identification, the name of the patient, date, time of collection, very important to be marked always on the side of the container, never on the lid. Again, there is always a witness system. Whenever a person is doing at least two andrologists and two embryologists should be working at a go. So one is performing and the other one is seeing that all the, you know, the name and uh, the identification has been done properly. Now, once the patient has uh, produced the semen, basically whenever a semen is uh, ejaculated, it is in a liquefied form. It gets into the coagulum and again, it liquefies within 15 to 16 minutes, 60 minutes. Now, what happens if even after half an hour, it is not liquefying, then you have to do pipetting. So try to dissolve the coagulum. Again, if it doesn't happen with that, then you have to add equal amount of media. Hippies buffered media you can add, which is again called cement washing media. Uh, it, again, it has to be at 37 degree temperature and you add it and mix it properly. And this is how you can do liquefaction. Now appearance, usually it is opaque. The opacity is related to the concentration of the sperm. Volume, volume is around 1.5 to 2 ml. Viscosity, again, it is very important. When the semen has been aspirated in a pipette and we, when you allow it to come drop by drop and when it makes more than two centimeter of thread, it is suggestive of abnormal viscosity and some sort of prostatic infection is there. So these are the patients ideally to be treated with antibiotics and the pH is alkaline 7.2 or more. Now, once the semen is liquefied, then we have to go for the microscopic examination. What we first see is concentration. In our, I mean, MBBS days, we used to study in pathology. We used to count RBC and WBC in newbar chamber. But again, if we use that, then the sperm are not going to get motile because you are going to dilute it with the distilled water. So the best method is to use a macular chamber. Now, macular chamber is a device where you have a grid where there are 10 rows and 10 columns. So altogether, if you see in a microscope, you can see 100 small squares. When you put a drop of semen and when you put this cover slip, what you see a lot of sperms are moving. So now what you have to do is you have to count your sperms in 10 small square. That is your count. So if your count is 50 in 10 small squares, then the number, the count of that person is 50 million per ml. Now, what is the problem here? Because once the first small uh, block you see, there are five sperms, the next uh, moment they are moving. So there will be two. But whenever you see it, you have to write it down and you go have to move to the another block. So count three or four rows, count three or four column and take an average. And that is going to be your count. Now, what is the normal range? Previously, the range was 20 million per ml. Now as uh, maybe whatever reason, genetic reason or the stress or, you know, the environment toxins, the count is common. So now the normal count is going to be million or more. Now, if the count is less than 5 to 15 million, 5 to 15 million, it is going to be high to moderate oligospermia. And if the count is less than 5 million, it is going to be called severe oligospermia. And azospermia, when no sperms are found in the semen, it is called azospermia. Azospermia is a very, you know, important uh, uh, I would say uh, entity because a lot of patients come up with a single report and there is no sperms found in the uh, semen sample. Whenever semen sample there is no sperm in the first drop, you have to do uh, rotations, you have to make a pallet, again you have to check the pallet. Sometimes you find few sperms in the pallet and then this entity is not called the azospermia but it is called cryptozospermia. 
these are the ideal patients you can help by doing IVA for ICSI. I would say ICSI instead of going for donor IVI. Again, isospermia you cannot stamp by a single report. You have to do two to three reports at around at least one week, ten days uh, difference, and you have to check the patient is genuine isospermia or not. Now, motility in natural fertility, I think motility matters the most. The most important sperms are those which are rapid forward progressive sperm. They are the sperms which are going to travel from the vagina to the uterine cavity till the fallopian tube and they are going to fertilize the oocyte. And grade B is slow and sluggishly moving sperm. Grade C are those are moving sperm. They are live but they are not move, progressive. And the fourth entity is immotile sperms. It, by just have, having a look, it is difficult to differentiate between immotile sperm and the dead sperm. Now, if there are more than 50% uh, of grade A, then it is a normal motility. Or if there is, sorry, if more than 50% of grade A plus B, then it is called a normal motility. And if it is grade, uh, more than 25% of grade A only, then it is normal. Now, when motility is less than the reference value, it is called asthenospermia. When you see a slide, a lot of times what you see is, there are, lot, there are a lot of motile sperms, they are sticking to each other. They are sticking to each other by head to head or tail to tail or there are clumps of sperms. This is suggestive of some sort of immunological problem and these are the ideal candidates which can go for IUI. Now very important is biochemical analysis. When the count is normal, when the motility everything is normal, fructose doesn't have, uh, examination of fructose doesn't have any role. It has a role when there is a suspect, uh, suspected azospermia cases. When fructose is present and when there is azospermia stamped by three samples, no sperms are found even after centrifugation. And when fructose is present, this shows that there is a problem in the spermatogenesis. When fructose is absent and when there is azospermia, then it gives you a clue that even fructose is not going, coming in the, uh, you know, uh, the semen because there is some sort of obstruction in the tract. Then it is suggestive of obstructive azospermia and you have a chance of finding the sperms either from the epididymis or from the testes. And again, leukocyte count, it should not exceed more than 1 uh, million per ml. The most important thing in any semen analysis is morphology. Because when we see a sperm, we see the count, we see the motility. But the most important thing is morphology. That gives us a clue. It is not the definitive marker, but it gives a clue that the sperms are going to be normal, the genetic is going to be normal, and the resultant embryo or whatever the baby is going to be normal. So uh, let me talk uh, about the uh, morphology uh, a little. The head, the, the sperm head is always oval. Around 60 to 70 percent of the part is covered by acrosomal crab, uh, acrosomal cap, and the head is the most important part because it is containing the DNA material which is required, which is the uh, required for the fertilization and for the uh, development of the embryo and baby. Then comes the neck. The neck contains the most important part in the sperm that is called centriole. Whenever a sperm is introduced in the egg, the egg is at a arrested stage. It is at metaphase to arrested stage when the sperm enters the egg. As soon as the centriole has been introduced, it gives a signal to the oocyte that the fertilization has started and the oocyte starts activating and the, it resumes its mu, uh, mitosis, meiosis and the cell cycle again resumes. Then there is a mid piece as all of us know it is covered by mitochondria sheet. It gives the uh, energy to the sperm to travel and the tail again is for the forward progressive motility. Now morphology. When 4% or less than 4% of sperms are normal then it is called teratozoospermia. And there are very few cases which we have encountered. I think 8 or 10 cases I have encountered in my life of globosospermia where you see only round-headed sperms. The head is always going to be round because there is what is lacking is the acrosomal cap. So when the acrosomal cap is lacking, it is called globosospermia. These patients we have tried with uh, ICSI. Uh, sometimes we have got the fertilization. The quality is always going to be bad and that's what my observation was and I am I am not sure whether any of those patients have got pregnancy or not. Uh, this is just the staining method. Okay, this is very important, not for IUI purpose, but there is the, all the andrologists because ultimately they are going to be an embryologist. Someday they are going to do their ICSI. Then what matters the most is the selection of a good sperm. 
a good embryologist or a senior embryologist is the person who is going to get the best sperms out of that cohort of millions for that few oocytes in doing ICSI. So if you see, there are few typical defects. Like if you see on this, the first row, the head is defective. The shape of the head is defective. The second row, if you see the vacuoles in the head, that is again very common and it is suggestive of some sort of genetic abnormality. Attachment of the neck to the head, it has to be tangential at 90 degree. When it is not there, again bad. The tail, when it is bent, short, double tail, these are again some sort of morphological abnormality which gives us a clue about its genetics. Now we have semen analysis is done. Now if you want to do sperm preparation for IUI. Now there is a basic question. Why do we need to process the sperms for IUI? At the time of ejaculations, the sperms are not in a position to fertilize. They don't have that capacity to fertilize the oocyte. They have to come out of the seminal plasma and that's how they acquire the fertilizing ability and that is called the capacitation. The seminal plasma is supposed to have decapacitating factors. So in raw semen, if you put few oocytes, it is a theory that it is not going to fertilize the oocyte. Now, as I have told you that the semen is full of sperms, normal sperms, abnormal sperms, immotile sperms, a lot of leukocytes. When the, the before analysis or before processing, if the sperms are exposed for longer to the seminal plasma, it is going to decrease the fertilizing capacity of the sperm. Why? Because all the dead sperm, immotile sperm, they are going to produce a lot of ROS, that is reactive oxygen species, and they are specifically going to affect the plasma membrane and may cause DNA damage. So the aim of IUI is to remove seminal plasma and dead sperms and to concentrate motile sperms. Now we have decided we want to do IUI. Now which preparation is to be done? There are a few basic approaches. First is sperm migration that is called swim up. It is an age old technique. The second one is selective washing. The, it is called density gradient. And the third one which is not practical but still we have to put it in our day-to-day -day practice that is simple dilution and washing. I will come, I will explain it. So now we have three processes to be done. You have a count, you have a motility. Now you have to decide which process we have to do. If the count is good, motility is good, everything is perfect, still you are doing IUI. Ideally these are not the cases you do IUI. But then the choice is either you can do swim up or you can do density gradient. When the count is low, motility is low, 5 to 15 million of count, then ideal you should go for density gradient. And when the count is less than 5 million, these are the tricky cases. But in Indian scenario, these are not the ideal cases for uh, IUI. But in Indian scenario, sometimes you have to go for IUI, maybe due to try, uh, money concern or whatever reason. You just want to give a try. And uh, these are the patients you have to do simple washing. Now, what is the basic principle? So what we do in swim up is we do we uh, I'll uh, there I'll go to that only sperms with good motility will be uh, able to reach the uppermost layer from the palate and all the dead and immortal sperms will remain in the palate. There are two techniques: one is overlay and second is underlay. We are going to talk about overlay technique. So what we do is we take a test tube. Once it is liquefied, we take the test tube. We we pour all the semen in it. Whether if it is like two ml of semen. Then we add pre-equilibrated, pre-equilibrated means the temperature of that is around 35 to 37 degrees Celsius of that media. We add the equal amount of media, we mix it properly, we don't make a lot of bubbles and if we make bubbles, we remove that, then we put that for centrifugation. It is around 1200 to 1400 RPM for 10 to 15 minutes. So what happens, after 15 minutes, when we take it out, there is a formation of palate. As you see in the second picture, there is a palate formation. And what is supernatant is all the dead sperm, bad sperm, immortal sperm and going to be the seminal plasma. What is our interest is the palate. So we remove the supernatant and we keep the palate. This is again a crucial step. You should not be mixing at this step. If you do it by mistake, then again, the whole process goes in way. So now you have palate. Again, it is mixed with a lot of good sperms, bad sperm, immortal sperm. So to separate them. How we do? We overlay 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 ml of pre-equilibrated media over it. And we put it at the 37 degrees Celsius for around half an hour, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And we give this palate time. So all the good sperms will 
try to go to the uppermost layer. And the theory is that the base sperm, the per, the sperms with the base motility will reach the uppermost layer, and that is the layer we take out after forty five minutes, and we use that for insemination. This is in this technique the problem. The theoretical problem is we are doing centrifugation with the semen. All the good sperm, bad sperm. So a lot of ROS must be produced, and that might be harming the sperm quality a lot. So there is a, again a different concept. It's called direct semen. So in a raw semen, you don't centrifuge. You just overlay one mL of media. So there is a semen. Media is there. If you do it properly, it's not going to get mixed because the density is going to be little different. Then you allow it to incubate for half an hour. So first you separate the good sperm. So from that semen, good sperm will go to the uppermost layer. after that half an hour you remove that 1 ml of media and that you do a wash so here you are selecting the best sperm first and then do you are centrifug doing centrifugation so the theory is that you are decreasing the chances of ros formation now second technique is density gradient the sperm specific gravity and centrifugation force it causes the sperms to go downwards when it has been rotated and the immature sperms which are having less density they are filtered in between there are two types used one is single density and the another is double layer now i'm going to talk about single density layer how we do it so first we take a test tube we pour the single density medium then we pour semen over it the density is different so it is not going to get mixed now you do a centrifugation for again 12 to 15 minutes For twelve hundred to fifteen uh, hundred RPM. So what it does is all the sperm, good sperm, bad sperm will try to move down till the bottom, but only the sperms with the best quality they will reach the lowermost layer. So after fifteen minutes, what you see there are three distinct layers. So the lowermost layer is all the density medium plus the good sperms which have traveled all the way across. You will see a nice fluffy ring. The intermediate in the second picture, if you see the intermediate fluffy ring, these are the this is the place where the sperms have tried to pass, but they the bad immortal sperms, and that creates the ring. And the uppermost layer is seminal plasma. So what is our interest is the density with the good sperm. So we remove the upper two layer again without disturbing the whole palate. And after this, what is left is in the third picture. If you see, you have a One uh, mL of density medium plus good sperm. Now your interest is to separate them again. So what? How you can do is now you add five mL of washing media. So you are diluting it, mix it properly. Again, do five to ten minutes rotations, means centrifugation. So what happens? Again, all the sperms will try to reach the bottom. They will make a small pallet, and after five to seven minutes, you take it out. you remove most of the part leaving 0.5 to 0.7 ml of the lower most part so what this lower most part contains is very few density medium particles plus good sperm and washing medium and this is what is to be used for insemination in iui now simple washing as i have told you when the count is low 5 million 2 million the patient is pleading that okay no you have to do iui with uh, me we don't have money whatever the reason the consultant decides okay i have to do iui if you try to do swim up if you do a wash make a pallet and try to do swim up you might not get a lot of sperms if you do density gradient again the sperm might not be able to reach the lowermost layer you might end up with no sperm so in this you do half of the swim up method so you take the semen sample add the media mix it do a rotation allowed to make the pallet once the pallet is there remove the uppermost layer now this pallet is going to contain all type of sperms good sperm bad sperm immortal sperm but we cannot separate them because the count is too low so we mix it and the straight that pallet we can use for insemination this is called simple washing the most important thing why the results in iui are less it is not all about the clinical part of it. it's not all about the lab part but what lab part we can improve first pre equilibration of media if you send the most common problem most of the periphery when we send the patient for i am really sorry uh, this might not be the situation in every pathology lab but sometimes if they are not pre equilibrating the media properly and they are using it for the uh, you know the washing or the uh, this uh, the whole process 
then they might hamper the quality of the sperm. So pre equilibration of media is important. Labyrinth air flow to be used to prevent infection. Air bubbles minimum because that trapped egg air when it is been rotated it produces a lot of ROS. When it is doing we are doing swim up while we are removing the upper uh, supernatant the pallet should not be mixed. And the most important part is once your sample is ready the endologist has to push his or her gynecologist to do the insemination because usually they are in the peak of their OPD time they are busy they are going for CS they say okay I'll come and do it no this is a priority because the more you wait with their palate in outside environment the sperms the quality is going to go down so it is always better as soon as the IUI procedure is been done ready or sorry the washing is done then the insemination should be done now very important in today's era what I want to touch upon is everyone is concerned whether the coronavirus is going to get involved in this cement processing and it is going to harm us. There are conflictive evidences which uh, so far uh, regarding that. Few have said no, it is not going to be there in the seminal plasma, not in the follicular food, fluid. So even the andrology as well as the embryology is going to be the safe. There are few papers in which they have found out the virus residues or probably how they have found it, I don't know, but there are papers where the survivors, when they have tested, they were tested, the semen was tested for uh, COVID-19. And the most important thing, day-to-day -day practice, maybe in, even in IUI, uh, sorry, IUI setup, as well as in IVF setup, when we cryopreserve the sperms. It is very important because we are going to preserve it in liquid nitrogen. And when we are preserving it in liquid nitrogen, there is always a chance of cross-contamination. So ideally during this era, whichever patients we are going to do, either they should be checked for COVID or if not, they should be considered that they might be positive and you should have, you have to keep it in a separate uh, place, not with all your previous samples. This is very important for all the people who are uh, endologists and embryologists who are working. I'm not going to touch upon how we do in the embryo freezing because uh, we are concentrating only on the endology part. So that is it. And uh, I thank you all. Uh, I know it's a different subject for you guys, but I have tried to simplify it for you guys. Thank you so much. And for pleasure and hearing. Sir, your voice is not audible. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dharmes. Uh, you have covered all aspect of the semen analysis as well as the IUI techniques, cement wash techniques very thoroughly and uh, very simple to understand way. So uh, there are a lot of uh, questions coming uh, for you also, but uh, we will take uh, as we have discussed after four lectures will complete. Now uh, Dr. Nagori sir has given us idea about the ideal stimulation. Dr. Sonal Ben has taught us to monitor the cycle and now you have uh, prepared the sample of the semen very well and uh, if we have done everything is right but still if we do not give proper luteal phase support then every thing all our efforts will be failed so i invite uh, dr jaya swami after all this preparation what is the importance of the luteal phase support uh, Dr. Tusar Bhai. Unmute Dr. Tusar Sa. Hello, Sana. Yes, sir. Unmute Dr. Tusar sir. Hello. Tushar, Dr. Tushar Bhai sir, come unmute karo. Unmute. Samara screen ma. You have to do unmute. Tamaru screen mute check your screen for uh, mute mute unmute karo. Sana, can you do it from Dr. Tusar, sir? Yes. Anyway, no problem, Dr. Jayas. 
वी आर स्टार्टिंग योर प्रेजेंटेशन एंड डॉक्टर जय समीन एवरीबडी नोज इन गुजरात एज वेल एज इन इंडिया इज ए वेरी रिनाउंड आई वी एफ स्पेशलिस्ट एंड ही रन द वेरी सक्सेसफुल आई वी एफ चेन नेम बिंग्स आई वी एफ एंड वी आर ऑल ईगर टू नो अबाउट ल्यूटल फेज सपोर्ट फ्रॉम डॉक्टर जयेश वेलकम डॉक्टर जयेश thank you uh thank you so much for kind introductions and uh, welcome to all delegates on the nice webinar which was arranged by the gujarat isas it's the first uh, uh, virtual meeting by the gujarat isa and a warm welcome from the all the our uh, speakers to all the delegates so today's topic in, is something luteal phase supports in iui when we are talking about luteal phase support i am just reminding one sentence of william hazlitt that when thing ceases to be a subject of controversy it ceases to be a subject of interest we know that a lot of controversy in luteal phase so again we are just going in detail in detail to know about the luteal phase support now just a minute huh so what is luteal phase first of a thing that we know we just go ahead about the finding out the uh, the the physiology of the luteal phase and as we know about the what is luteal phase that this is the physiology after ovulation as we know about the the endocrinology during the follicular phase the because of the effect of the fs the follicle is grow and expand and then followed by the estrogen is going to be secreted by the the cells and ultimately at the end of the day estrogen is going to get a peak and the lasting of the 200 picogram per 48 to 50 hours of this estrogen will lead to a something ls surge and increasing lh level so the most important hormone which is responsible for the luteal phase is lh lh is a very crucial hormone which is required for the rupture as well as because of the effect of this lh it it is going to be secrete a uh, progesterone the crucial hormone for the maintenance of the pregnancy for the corpus luteum so progesterone is going to be increased in the later part and this is called luteal phase where the progesterone is increased after ovulation for 14 days where estrogen is slightly lower and progesterone is in higher to maintain the pregnancy if there is no pregnancy we know that there is a changes in the endometrium from proliferative to secretory phase of the menstruation and cascade of molecular events will occur it is a crucial hormone for the receptivity because of the effect of the progesterone the certain genomic expression which that in turn leads to a formation of the cytokines which is responsible for the implantation now what about the after the physiology the physiology which says something that corpus luteum role is to produce progesterone which is necessary to obtain secretory transformations so corpus luteum survives because of the lh activity we consider that lh is a very crucial hormone to uh, to survive the corpus luteum now if you see about the what what effect what make wrong that it will lead to it will require exogenous progesterone what make wrong in certain uh, fertility practice so if you consider logically it might be something inefficient in sufficient corpus luteum right this is the one thing that where the endogenous progesterone is not supportive and second thing is that the lh the crucial hormone which is secreted which is responsible to maintain the corpus luteum might be it is suboptimal in maybe in the pcod maybe in the endometriosis or an expecting fertility and the last part is the last uh, uh, our end organ is endometrium if there is any defect or response on the endometrium with the effect of the progesterone there will be a something a delayed implantations or maybe we can consider as a low pregnancy rates or like low life birth rate now after clearing the physiology what will be the role of progesterone why is it why progesterone how can we come to know that progesterone is required to maintain the pregnancy as we know in the late in 1972 when the american people uh, uh, are doing the tubal ligations and during tubal ligation the accidental pregnancy which was observed and because of the certain low what they do they, they do during tubal ligation they remove the corpus luteum and as they remove the corpus luteum they find out there is a regression so progesterone is the most important hormone for the maintenance of the pregnancy and even though when the patient patient want the pregnancy continuation of the pregnancy then they give exogenous progesterone so by this all 1972 and 1970 publications we can understand that progesterone is a crucial hormone to maintain the pregnancy during the luteal phase and as 
The luteal phase in natural cycle, we already observed the, how the hormone is going to be changed. The prevalence of a luteal phase defect in natural cycle in normal luteal patients with primary or secondary is around 8.1% about the luteal phase uh, deficiency. Now, what about the where, where, why we are requiring this luteal phase support in naturally also, and which are the conditions where we are uh, required luteal phase support? So, why it is a defect? So, we can consider, consider that there is a disorder in proper follicular genesis or there is a defective corpus luteum functions, or there will be aberrant end organ response by the endometrium, and the variety of clinical conditions in our day-to-day -day practice may be hyperplexinemia, may be hyperandrogenic states, weight loss, trace, and athletic training may result not in oligo or anovulations, but rather may be or manifest as luteal phase defect. So, now, what we can see, what is the pathophysiology that why we require progesterone support in certain conditions in the stimulation, especially in the IUI and IVF. Today we'll more focus on IUI, but as we know, IUI is a condition when there is a multiple follicle of different size might ovulate at different time, expanding more supraphysiological level of estrogen and progesterone. That is a negative feedback mechanism in internally reduce the LH level, in turn make the corpus luteum inefficient to produce more subendogenous progesterone. So this is the way we can say in the more stimulated cycle, especially when you have a multi-follicle enlargement, they will shorten the luteal phase support. And in that conditions, there is an improper corpus luteum functions, which in turn requires the progesterone supports in the multi-follicle, maybe the IUI. So now, what is the luteal phase deficiency? How can we can diagnose? And as we know, I'm there is still it is a mystery of the luteal phase support, which will be best defect in the to diagnose. But as we know that the common symptom is maybe premature onset of the menses, less progesterone level, less than 10 uh, nanogram per milliliter, and the leg, uh, laying of the uh, the endometrium more than two days, which will be considered as a luteal phase defect. But we know that these are all are having some controversy. We know that the progesterone is having a certain peak and down peak. So we cannot measure the exact progesterone level in the body. There is also some variation of the measurement of the progesterone level by the certain chemistry. And we can consider the latest, late, latest publication on the fertility study that histological dating should not be considered as an ideal method to diagnose the luteal phase defect. So what is the last opinion of ASRM committee opinion to diagnose this uh, uh, luteal phase defect? There is no reproducible physiological relevant and clinical practical standard to diagnose LPD or distinguish fertile for infertile women. So still, we need to give progesterone supports when we have a stimulation. So let us start with the, what is the evidence of luteal phase support, especially in the IUI? How can we, what are the evidence which is available? So let us see the latest publications of uh, 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 the uh, publication which was published in uh, 2012 of 149 patients with unexplained infertility and who underwent 166 recombinant follicle stimulating hormone and stimulation IUI where prospective randomizing two groups where 71 patients received vaginal progesterone gel supplementation this IUI, IUI stimulations and 78 patients received luteal supports. They find out that Luteal support with vaginal progesterone affect the success of gonadotropin stimulated IUI cycle with multi follicular response, but not with the monofollicular response. So I want to highlight that you require more progesterone if you have a more follicles. If you have a more estrogen, you require more progesterone to sustain the pregnancy. That is what this evidence says. And let us just find out the uh, meta analysis which was published in 2013 the role of luteal phase in especially in the IUI. And this is the meta-analysis which considered a five randomized control trial and around 102, uh, 1,298 patients undergoing 1,938 IUI cycles. What is the conclusion of this meta-analysis to give the luteal phase support in IUI? As we know that there are a lot of people, those who are doing CC plus IUI, or CC plus gonadotropin and IUI, and where we know that a certain group of populations where we go gonadotropin and IUI. So these are the three different groups where this luteal phase support is required according to this evidence. And conclusion is very clear and crystal. What they say is that the progesterone luteal phase supports may be of benefit to patients undergoing ovulation induction with gonadotropin and IUI cycles. They say that, that luteal phase support is not required in CC induced IUI cycle or CC plus gonadotrophin IUI cycle. So gonadotrophin and IUI cycle 
will require the luteal phase support. This is a one, one meta analysis in 2013. To review that, the doubling the sampling size in after 2013, again, the another 11 randomized controlled trial, which will include it in 2070 to make the database more stronger. And what it says in this 2017, what they include, Again, they have a two randomized control trial. They included CC plus IUN luteal phase support. They have a CC plus gonadotropin and pi randomized control trial. There they also include the luteal phase support and without luteal phase support. And lastly, they have a gonadotropin four randomized control trial where they include the with and without luteal phase support. What they use in that progesterone support, they use crinone 8% gel daily. They use a passery in the dose of 600 to 800 milligram daily or 200 milligram TDS or 300 BD or 400 BD, and they use the SCG for uh, 5,000 or 6,500 or 10,000 for the triggering for the ovulation. They include around 2,842 patients undergoing IUI for 4,065 cycles, where they get the meta analysis publication in 2017. What they conclude at the end of the day, they find out that they conclude the clinical pregnancy rates with and without the luteal phase support in cc induced cycle and gonadotropin cycles. And they said that the luteal phase support is not required. It will not improve the clinical pregnancy rate. They don't have a data of live birth rate in cc induced cycle, but they have a clinical pregnancy rate which was not improved by a luteal phase support. Even by providing a luteal phase, that is the, preg the, the clinical pregnancy rate is not increased. But if you see the gonadotropin cycles, then the live birth rate will be drastically improved when you provide in the luteal phase support. So the conclusion of the 2013 and 2018 met 17 meta analysis is that level one RCT data demonstrate that exogenous progesterone during the luteal phase improves both clinical pregnancy and live birth rates in patients undergoing gonadotropin ovulation actions in IUI. Data do not demonstrate improved outcomes with progesterone luteal phase support in CC or laterozole ovulation induction cycle. Now the next question is now we, we concluded the conclusion that yes, luteal phase support we required, especially in the gonadotropin induction cycles in IUI, it is not required in CC induced cycle or laterozole induced cycle. But then the problem, the question is that when we can start the progesterone in IUI cycle. This is the publication in 2008, 2009, and 2010. It was clearly demonstrated that you can start on the day of IUI. Mind well, the people, those who are going to start progesterone earlier. So no earlier and no late. You need to start on the day of USAID trial or on the day of IUI where you are going to do IUI on that day. One day later, it doesn't make any sense, but earlier it will always going to reduce. So don't give luteal phase support on the day of SCG. That is a clear case message that what I want to deliver. Now, when we are discussing about the starting dose, we need to discuss about where we can stop. And if you want to ask about the stopping of the progesterone, let us go ahead the physiology again. What is this diagram shows that, that when there is a pregnancy implantation is there, the corpus luteum will going to be survive and going to maintain the pregnancy for 8 to 10 weeks. So there is a shift of a placental formations and shift from luteoplacental shifts. The luteoplacental shift was observed around 8 to 10 weeks. So now, why I am showing this slide, the purpose is that, the next question is that when we can stop the progesterone, especially in the IUI cycle. I know that no studies, uh, no uh, withdrawing progesterone in IUI is still debatable. But that minimum 14 days from the day of the ET that is on the in the embryo transfer cycle, it has been said that you can go up to the physiology. So that means eight to ten weeks of this gestation when there is a luteoplacental shift is, is occurred. Now, as what there is no any demonstration of no study, let us go because it's a multi follicle enlargement. A lot of study are saying that, and a lot of study uh, meta analysis have demonstrated that the luteal phase support is as equal to as what we are doing doing in the IVF. So let us just 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 see the what the IVF are saying something about the the cessation of stopping of the support, luteal phase support in a stimulated cycle. There are two studies which says that the stimulated cycle on the day of the confirmation of the pregnancy, that means on the day of beta C positive. So in the IUI cycle we can also consider that we can stop the progesterone support on the day of beta C G or on the day of pregnancy is visible. Another second study which is say something, uh, Velasco in the Spain, what it says that, what the earliest we can before five weeks, 
before eight weeks we can stop that with five weeks so these are the three study three understanding we can stopping of the progesterone one is luteal placental shift that is eight to ten weeks second by the latest uh, publication in 2012 and 2030 you can stop the progesterone on the day of the pregnancy or earliest you can stop the uh, uh, progesterone or five weeks of the gestation and this is what i'm showing that this is a meta analysis if you see look at the 11 meta 11 randomized control trial if you see the progesterone supplementations still there is a varied observation in all meta analysis only two or three studies where we can say they stop the progesterone eight to ten weeks majority of the people still continue the progesterone up to 12 weeks that is the what is the observation in the meta analysis 11 meta analysis in the iui uh, supplementations of the uh, luteal phase support now the last question which was addressed by me is that which progesterone that is what we are asking in the IVA. but let me just confirm in iui that which progesterone and everybody knows that we are just using vaginal progesterone but what will be the evidence the evidence again this meta analysis which was published in 2017 11 randomized control trial and they are saying this is the multi follicle enlargement which is equivalent to the IVF and uh, equivalent to IVF practice. So they say that they are using the same dose. That means they use 200 milligram 1 TDS, 400 milligram BD, or crinone gel 8% a day for the luteal phase support. Even though what we can say then which type can we use a progesterone like dedrogesterone, the oral progesterone, and what are the uh, the the evidence? I say before that either use whatever the progesterone is equivalent. This is the publication. We say that whatever the but the vaginal uh, micronized vaginal progesterone will be the safer and more compliance uh, to the patients during the IUF practice. And lastly, this is the one publication which is in support of the Lufastone in 2013. The progesterone 150 infertile women and they provide a 20 milligram, 10 milligram BD versus 400 milligram BD. A vaginal micronized progesterone where they concluded that as good as result which was observed and let us go beyond something to compare because a stimulated cycle in IVF the latest publication of the lotus which again say improve live birth by providing the uh, the uh, didrogesterone in the dose of one TDS so this is a new way to go forward and especially in my clinic also we are starting using a lupastone a 10 milligram 1 TDS in IOI stimulatory cycle where corpus luteum is always present and we have a bad, bad, uh, equivalent output as compared to the micronized vaginal progesterone. Now last question will be like that, what is the dose of progesterone? And as we know that we all people are using a lot of doses for a lot of durations, as we know that more is not harmful, this is what we are believing. On the literature for dose is very limited, and this dose is 300 to 600 milligrams. This is the one publications for the stimulated IVF cycle. There is no any IUI cycle uh, publications for the dose publications for the uh, vaginal progesterone. So we can say something all the randomized control uh, study. This is what the randomized uh, 11 randomized control trial. They also use 200 milligram 1 TDS and 400 milligram BD or 8% gel. And the latest publications and by experience, you can say 10 milligram 1 TDS or 10 milligram 1 BD do first on will be the alternative protocol for luteal phase supports in IUI in multi follicular uh, enlargement. So what will be the conclusion? The conclusion is very clear. Neutral cycle and multi follicular response LPS is not required. CC induced cycle LPS is not required. Gonadotropin cycle and multi follicular response, yes, LPS is luteal phase support is required. Vaginal micronized progesterone treatment of choice. Dufastone will require more data for IUI will be required. But according to Lotus publication IVF, it might be the alternative to vaginal progesterone. Start on the day of IUI or maybe slightly one day later. It is better uh, to start on the day of IUI. Those no studies still confirm to the dose of the vaginal progesterone, maybe 200 milligram PDS, the standard practice or 300 BD, that is what we are doing in our IVF practice, when to stop on the day of positive beta CG, or you can only stop 8 to 10 weeks where the utero placental shift is occurred, and giving more progesterone in higher dose of longer duration is observed in most clinical practice around the world. So I have seen something, the maternalist also, they continue the progesterone for 12 weeks, but in my practice, if you consider that we will continue up to 8 to 10 weeks, and certain time in IUI practice, we stop the lufastone or whatever the progesterone we are using around five to six weeks when pregnancy is good and corpus luteum is sufficient. Uh, 
Lastly, I can say the schematic diagram of the luteal phase support to make it very easier. It is again a carry on message that it is only and only required when you are going to stimulate it, the IUI cycle with the gonadotropy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. Uh, it was a nice uh, elaboration of the luteal phase support in uh, mainly routine practice as well as IV, IUI cycle. And uh, we have a lot of uh, questions regarding luteal phase support also. Uh, at last, I would like to thank all the faculties uh, who have covered uh, their given topic very nicely to the point, mainly practical aspects as the, our goal of all this CME uh, and webinar is concerned. Uh, I would like to announce that uh, more, more than 300 uh, delegates are viewing uh, this webinar. So uh, I congratulate all the faculties and uh, all the office bearers of the Gujarat chapter ISA to wonderfully organize uh, this seminar. And uh, I would like to thank you uh, Bharat Serum people also and uh, the technical team, Sasan and uh, Sana also to provide a lot of help to organize this seminar. Now it is a time to question answer to all the faculties. And uh, I, I got a lot of questions uh, from all over the Gujarat and out of Gujarat also. Uh, any Anything you want to say, Dr. Tusar? You're, you're, you have to unmute first. You have to unmute and then speak. You are not audible. Okay, now? Yes. yes. Okay, fine. Uh, let me thank all the speakers for their excellent performance. And I think the messages regarding the stimulation of the ovary, monitoring of the ovulation, sperm wash and luteal supports are very clear. I think there are a lot of questions and query are from the audience. So let them solve one by one. So we uh, start with uh, first question to Dr. Nagori sir. Uh, I have a lot of question regarding the stimulation protocol regarding PCOS, right? So uh, uh, in the sum up, I ask you one single question. What is the ideal stimulation protocol for the PCOS? The ideal stimulation protocol, if you do a baseline scan, that will tell you how much gonadotropin is to be given to the patient. But to all the patients, uh, we always give letrozole from day 3 to day 7. Okay. And we add gonadotropin so that the dose of gonadotropin is also less and there are no multiple follicles. You always get less number of follicles and the pregnancy rates are very good. Sir, right. sir, sir, which gonadotropin and which dose? Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that all of you must be knowing that letrozole is the first line of treatment as right. PCO. There is no role of clomiphene citrate as far as the PCO is concerned according to ASRM recommendations on the PCO 2018. So I will use letrozole number one. Second thing, I always rely on recombinant FSN. The, re the reason is that the dose required is less. Then even if I want to titrate the dose to 50 international unit or 37.5 international unit, then I can do it with the pen device and that's why I, I normally use a recombinant FSH always. Never use SMJ as far as the PCO is concerned because the LH level is already high and you are adding more LH to the patient, it is likely to be detrimental to an OVA. And we can't check the LH level every day. So it is better the drug which is not required, that LH is not required. And that's why I will not use HMG. I will always go to recombinant FSH. Or if you have got a highly purified FSH, then you may try with the five international unit. If you don't get a multiple follicle, then it is fine. But sometimes you may get multiple follicles and that's why you have to rely on recombinant FSH when you can give only 25 units or 37.5. So in nutshell, let us all from day 3 to 7. Day 7 you do an ultrasound and then accordingly you decide the dose of gonadotropin, either 37.5 or 75 you should start. Chaitanya, one question. Am I audible, right? Yes. yes. Uh, 
uh, one question if on the day eight ultrasound the follicle size is only 11 or 12 mm could you extend the letrozol for three four days more no no i will not add letrozol so i would like to tell you there are two papers i think there is one question also whether we can combine letrozol plus clomiphene citrate that is only one paper yeah. available in the literature it's not a good combination yeah. can i tell you that why we are using the letrozol because from day 7 onwards the lh level comes down then that is what we want for improvement of the follicle now if you consider that is an extended letrozol regime yes there is also one paper on this uh, that extended uh, letrozol regime but here your purpose is not served because your lh level continue to grow even if the follicle grows and 10 mm size or 11 mm size is a very good size even if you don't add gonadotropin to this patient this others this patient may continue also and you may get a good follicle but best is to add 37.5.5 international unit to this patient okay and that's the follicle okay and uh, one more question to you dr nagori sir uh, dose of dexamethasone 0.5 mg for how long in a clomiphene stimulated cases and can we combine it with let, uh, letrozol this is dr meera gupta 0.5 mg clomiphene citrate that is to be given and that is to be given at night because it uh, decreases the acth nanite and that is why it is always to be taken at night and that is to be given continuously for all the 30 days and you can give it up to 3 to 6 months till you are giving clomiphene citrate cycles to this patient okay and uh, during pregnancy we have to stop immediately yeah once the patient consumes you have to stop it we have to stop right see some and, patients, some of the patients may get edema then you can reduce the dose by oh. to this patient or sometimes you may stop it after the ovulation and once again you can start it particularly in those cases who get uh, too much edema on the body okay then only you can decrease the dose otherwise 0.5 is an ideal dose so one more question is from dr trupti pandit idar she is telling that uh, one uh, she is describing she has given description but the patient is pco and one cycle it is a good response with the letrozol and again patient not consume so should we repeat the same dose in the next or we should we change she has given 5 mg what she has mentioned and with the day uh, she has seen follicle of 22 on 11th day i think you try with 2.5 mg only and perhaps then you will get a gradual growth of follicle and the patient see the conception in every cycle should be considered statistically even if in one patient a one cycle the patient does not conceive doesn't mean that the uh, the drug is not effective so either you can give letrozol and if the patient can afford then you can add gonadotropin go for a doppler and get a good follicle and then you do iui success rate will be very good and uh, one more question is for dr dharmesh dharmesh uh, it is a very broad question they have asked what uh, to manage male factor abnormalities like azuspermia and severe oligospermia count less than 5 million per ml dr kiran uh dr kiran less than 5 million uh, count uh, the first thing you have to see is about the morphology most of the times when the count is low the morphology is always affected so it is always uh, oligo peritosospermia these are ideal patients for ivf they are not ideal cases for uh, iui so whenever these patients are posted for ivf the most important thing which i would love to advise to all the andrologist is the most the problem here is most of the time semen analysis is always been done by the juniors the most junior people and when this patient is been you know uh, designated for ivf and when they suddenly see it in the xt table oh we cannot see good quality sperms ultimately that is the problem so what i suggest is always uh, this type of patients when the oligospermia patients is are there when they are posted for uh, higher treatment it should be checked by the embryologist very important is to find out whether he or she will be able to find out good sperms for insemination or not very important because on the last day when you tell the patient that okay this is the patient and your sperms are not good the embryo quality is not good 
I mean, that is not fair on the patient part because most of the, uh, you know, the cycle is been done. So it is very important for the counseling purpose. We can always try with those pumps for the counseling of the patient is it is important. So less than 5 million, I think that is the best way to deal is to go for the XT. I don't think uh, anyone is doing IUI with that. I, I uh, have a one very technical question uh, from Dr. Paresh Patel, Disa. He asked that, what about microfluidetics from spotting chip? Usually, and, uh, you should, uh, should we use in IUI or no? Uh, I would suggest, I mean, I'm not in favor of that. Most of the times, uh, microfluidics is used usually for the IVF purpose or for specifically XC purpose. And when the DFI is high, that, uh, the DNA fragmentation index is high, these are the patients when we use that. Okay, Dr. Jayas, one question is for you. You, you have to unmute yourself. If patient conceived in a natural cycle with bad obstetric history, Right. Then what type of progesterone is given and by what routes of administration, Dr. Snehal Patel? Yeah, I like to say something when there is a BOH there or something recurrent pregnancy loss history there, there are evidence which was, uh, I think, a comic et al. study which says something in comparison of the other study of vaginal micronized progesterone. And it is 10 milligram BD of Bufastron which is having growing live birth, especially in this uh, I got recurrent miscarriage previous uh, uh, to improve the live birth rate. So apart from that, uh, there is no role. I can, I can say something about when there is a history of like that, we can add Bufastron 20 milligrams. The actual dose which was required, I cannot say something like that. Maybe 20 milligram or maybe 30 milligram. But uh, there is no role of vaginal micronized progesterone when there is a history of uh, recurrent miscarriage. Really. As from myself, I am asking, uh, what is your uh, concept about uh, our uh, oral progesterone, SR progesterone preparation? No, because I am not interested. I'm, see, there is no any data of SR and still I'm not in, I have not tried of the SR and uh, I am only interested in uh, the, the protocol which was already published at Experience. It is around vaginal micronized progesterone. And uh, there are a lot of side effects by liver bypass, so there means less absorption because of the oral uh, uh, the SR preparation. Uh, the other vaginal effervescent preparation is also available tablet that is also having a lot of side effect will be there. The patient is not compliance to use it, so we are very strict to the uh, standard protocol which was used in the uh, IUI or whatever the other bad obstetric history where I can use vaginal micronized progesterone. Will be the choice of the treatment. Maybe a uh, 400 milligram BD, 300 milligram, or 200 milligram one days. That is what not we are using 300 BD or 400 BD when there is no bad obstetric history, and we are adding Lufastone to improve the live birth rate. No, no. Apart from apart from BOH for routine use, I have personally used lot many cycles with the oral progesterone, and uh, I found it useful. Though no international is. data is there. Yes, yes. I don't have any uh, experience for that and we are always using to the vaginal micronized progesterone and maybe do first turn for the future for those who are having a miscarriage. And uh, one uh, question is from Dr. Archana. She is from Punjab. So, uh, she asked uh, Dr. Nagori, I think, uh, mild stimulation for poor responder. I think uh, this is going towards IVF, I think. But uh, without IVF, can you explain it, sir? Uh, if you ask me a mild stimulation, if you, for an IUI, uh, a poor responder in IVF, I think it is a terminology. For IUI, I don't believe there is something like a poor responder. because Your if score, I, Scoring system, suppose all the scores are low. Uh, but still, if I got an enteral follicle count, two on one side and two on the other side, then I will consider it as a natural responder. Normal responder, I would consider. Only thing, I have to decide the dose according to my chart, whether I should start with 150 units or can I start with 75 units to this patient. Even letrozole plus gonadotropin is a very good combination as far as the poor responders are concerned mm -hmm. in an idea. And same can be applied to an yes. idea also. You can start letrozole, give gonadotropin, and you will get one or two follicles. I tell you my own data, which is I have collected already, I am going to publish it. We have 30 patients where the AMH is between 0.2 to 0.9. And all these patients have conceived with an IVR. What I want is the message to be conveyed to you. 
then in IUI you require one or two follicles. In IVF you require more follicles. And that may not be possible and that's why these were the patients who were asked for home donation because it was for an IVF. Then we counsel that patient that let us try for some time. So in an IUI you require one or two follicles, not more than that. And if you get a good follicle, by Doppler, if you say that the quality is very good, then you can definitely do an IUI because tubes are open, husband semen is normal then this patient should conceive. Chaitanya, how many minimum cycles should be tried? Uh, a very maximum cycle, I mean. A very good question. If I tell you the exact data in the literature, mm. up to, if you, I think there is a very good book and that is an evidence based by John Cohen. And he has said that if the age of the patient is less than 30 years, if the time is not a factor, the nine cycles should be tried for an IUI. Otherwise, six cycles should be tried for an IUI. And if you consider the age more than 38 years, then two cycles should be tried for an IUI. And if the age is more than 40 years, then one cycle, this is an evidence base which has been published. So I believe at that at least three to four cycle must be given to a patient after the age of even 35. The patient can, by proper counseling to the patient and proper IUI should be done. I always tell that most of the time the IUI is blamed that it is not giving a good pregnancy. <laughs> it's an IUI that gives you a pregnancy. It's a good stimulation protocol, yes. good outcome monitoring, good IUI preparations and a good luteal support. All four of us. Yes, yes. all four of you. So, so it is more up, difficult than IVF. Then you get a very good result. So roll up six should be individualized. Yes. <laughs> right. And uh, one question is from Trichy. Dr. Raja Ilavarsi, what is the treatment for high uterine artery on baseline USG? I think she is asking Sonal, high uterine artery PI, I think, on baseline USG. Yeah, I, hello Raji. So, uh, uh, if, if, the baseline, if the baseline uterine artery is high, it means that the androgen is high. If the androgen is high, the patient is usually a PCO. You have to stimulate the patient or treat that patient according to PCO. And uh, there is no other treatment for that. You only have to take care that you develop uh, follicles properly as told by sir um, for the PCO stimulation. And once the follicles are grown, the estrogen level will deal with that androgen and the uterine artery PI will come down at the time of trigger. Okay, and uh, one more technical question to Dr. Dharmes. Uh, after how much time of preparation of semen sample, IUI should be done to get the highest success rate? Mm -hmm. And what should be the total time interval between the semen sample collection and IUI? Dr. Paresh Patel from DISA. Uh, one simple thing is, the first question is, uh, when it is to be done? Uh, very clear and very uh, straightforward it is as soon as possible. Once it is done, once the IUI sample is ready, you should not be waiting for any uh, extra minute. The reason being, whatever guys we are doing, it is in vitro. It is not the natural process. It is not, you know, normal environment for the sperms or uh, for the, its vitality. So as soon as it is ready, as I have told in my talk, that it is ready, it should be inseminated. Second thing, once the semen is collected, and once it starts liquefying, once it is properly liquefied, whether it takes 15 minutes, 20 minutes or half an hour, then you can start your processing. Because if you start before that, then you are going to have a lot of problem in your uh, washing techniques. So I think insemination as soon as possible and to start the processing after collection when the semen is already liquefied. So, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, other questions, but uh, all are like uh, similar kind of a question. Uh, so, that are, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, covered in the presentation or uh, question and session. And uh, one, one vague question uh, or detailed question, I would say, Dharmesh, is that what to do about azuspermia and uh, how to manage zero sperm count? I think it will be a all uh, new topic to start with to manage azospermia and uh, I would like to announce that uh, our Gujarat chapter ISAR is planning a half day uh, 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 webinar on the mail only so we will cover all this question during that uh, webinar of the male infertility be in touch with the Gujarat chapter 
and on the next saturday we are uh, going very deep into the fertility practice we are covering only endometrium as a topic and we have planned three lecture on the analysis and management of the endometrium and various thin endometrium or evaluation of endometrium and hysteroscopic evaluation of endometrium so i request everybody to join again on next saturday to uh, gujarat chapter isar uh, webinar and i think uh, till then uh, uh, we are closing this webinar and uh, i would request dr tusar sa to thanks all uh, faculties and the final comments yes thank you mehul i on behalf of gujarat isar let me thanks all the faculties and all the members who are watching this seminar for attending it and it is our great pleasure to make such a seminar in future also and uh, as mehul told next saturday we are going to make seminar on endometrium as a whole and we will cover all aspect of endometrium thank you very much and we will meet on next saturday thank you thank you nagori sahib thank you sonal ben thank you jayesh thank you dharmesh thank you thank all. you very much